Okay, let's turn to um, 2 Peter chapter 2. Revert, we'll read verses 1 through 22 for the reading of God's Word. Um, last time I was here, we talked about uh, chapter 1 of 2 Peter, and I'll talk about little distinctions here and there, but it goes hand in hand with what um, Pastor Goat is teaching, you know, the end times, uh, the book of Revelation, the, the false teaching, the heresy that goes on toward the end of days, to persevere into the end, you know, to be watchful, to pray, and to be prepared, uh, because we do not know the hour or the, or the day that the Lord will appear. So in 2 Timothy, I mean 2 Timothy, excuse me, 2 Peter, um, in verse 1 it says, but, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. For if God spared not the angels at sin, but cast, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world, and the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an, in, a, an example unto those that after should live ungodly, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For if that righteous man dwelling among them, and seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds, the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation, and to reserve the unjust unto the day of of judgment to be punished. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanliness and despise government, presumptuous are they, self-willed, they are not afraid to speak evil of dignities, whereas angels which are greater in power and might bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord. But these, as natural brute beasts may to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understandeth not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption." and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that counted pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls and heart that they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosar, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity. The Damas, speaking with man's voice, forbade the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with the tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness. Those that were clean escape them from them who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome, of the same as he brought into bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it is better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. May the Lord bless to us the reading of his word. So, if we had to give a title to this specific uh, message this morning, we're going to title it, Know the Messenger. You know, the, the book of um, 1 Peter and 2 Peter are a little bit different from one another. Same as we were talking about last time that the churches were the same, similar churches to the one that the seven churches in the book of Revelation were addressed to. Asia Minor, Galatia, Pontus, Cappadocia, Bithynia. Those were the churches that were establishing the, the nucleus of the new church, of the, of the church that was going to be established, which is hopefully what we are in the first epistle of Peter. The intent of the second epistle is different than the intent of the first letter that Peter wrote to these individuals. 
So the, those particular churches, the first epistle of Peter was about the dangers and difficulties counteracted as e external because they had persecutions. They had um, the heathen and the population, the unbelievers. And the purpose was to strengthen, comfort, and encourage the churches in their endurance of, of persecution from without. And that's exactly what was happening. They were being persecuted from without. This was, you know, oh, Jesus has come now, but, you know, your idols, your gods, everything else that you have worshipped is wrong. You've been doing this for a long time. Jesus is the way. He is the, 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 um, the truth. And so these people didn't take it lightly. So it was persecution. There was danger. The purpose was to comfort the church, to encourage them. Uh, 1 Peter 4, 12 through 14, it says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted in the name of Christ, you are blessed. We went over that this morning because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. So the key teaching in 1 Peter was persecution. Christians are able to identify with Christ's sufferings when they are persecuted for their faith. So the letter to the church was, you know, God's going to comfort you. God is accessible. God is faithful. God is holy. God is just. God is long-suffering. God is merciful. And God is righteous. And those were the key ingredients that Peter was telling those churches, this is who God is. So regardless of how you were being persecuted and how you were going to be reviled against and, and condemned and everything else and, and blasphemed against, Know that God is all of these things to you. He's going to protect you. He's going to watch over you. He's going to provide for you. Well, if you can't beat them, what, what's the phrase? Join them. So if we can't beat, what happens now with, with ISIS, I'm sorry for getting political, but we know of ISIS, we know of, of um, in Iran, Iraq, and, and those places in the Middle East, that there's a battle going on. But what's our battle here in the United States? Satan, but what else? Do we, are we fighting uh, ISIS here? Okay, are they not little cell groups? Not our Twin Towers? Were they not destroyed for one reason or the other? So we're now we're fighting somebody who's internal. The, the, um, the um, Marines and the soldiers who were at the um, recruitment bases. They were, they were killed right under our noses. And so not only are, is the persecution coming from outward that we're dealing with, but now it's infiltrated. It's within our ranks. So Second Peter is, a, is the difficulties that we're countering inside the church. And that's exactly what Peter was telling the churches, that your battle now is no longer on the outside. You've dealt with that. You've overcome that. You know, you stood firm. You've turned the other cheek. You've, you've blessed these people. You are coexisting with them. They see who you are. They see your character. They see your love. You, they see the spread of the gospel. They see people changed. You, that's not your problem anymore. Your problem is what's inside of you right now. And those churches that were in the book of Revelation talked about what? Lukewarmness, leaving their first love, things that had to do with inside. Very little about what was happening on the outside, but now how they were dealing with issues that were happening inside. So in second epistle of Peter, and the dangers and the difficulties were internal. First Peter focuses on, to, on a couple of things. Know your salvation. Know who your heavenly father is. Be sure of your salvation. Conf a confirming relationship with God through Christ Jesus. And we saw that the first time in, in 1 Peter 1, 3 through 11, that added to all of these th things, we, are, we have godliness, self-control, steadfastness. We have brotherly affection, brotherly uh, love. And, and if these qualities are yours and increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because if we lack these things, we are blind. So one thing that First Peter was teaching them is to know who you are. You know, stand firm. You know, know that you are a believer. Know what you believe. Know who you are in your relationship with Christ because when the trials and tribulations come, remember the parable of the sower and the seed, some seed fell on what? On the gravel and what happened? Had no root, withered and died. Some fell upon the thorns and because of the cares of the world and the lusts 
and deceitfulness of sin, it didn't grow. You know, some fell right in the open and, and the ravens came and took away the seed, but some fell on fruitful ground and multiplied it and, um, and was fruitful and, and became to give root and, and so forth. So know who you are. Know your salvation. You know, no one can take that from you. No one can, can just erase that. If we're saved, truthfully saved, if we are believers in Christ, and only time will tell, is because we have that relationship with Christ and nothing, nothing is going to pluck us from God's hands. So know your salvation. And that was Peter was telling them. Know your scriptures. Toward the end of, of uh, 2 Peter, he says, know your scriptures. Scripture is inspired by God. Know what God is telling us. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. When the preaching was going on in the early church, they, the, in, in, um, the brethren just would look at the scriptures to, to make sure what they were teaching was right, was correct, was authentic. And so in 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter is telling them to make sure that you know the scriptures. Know who you are, know your relationship with Christ, and know what you believe. Because these things are essential. Because if you know these things, you know, sometimes, you know, I don't know how many of you sent your kids off to college or to school, but we told them what, what you know, be, be smart. You know, my, when my daughter started drive in Miami, I told them, be street smart. You know, be street smart. Because, you know, someone hits you from behind and it's just a bump, your first reaction is to get out and see what they want. Well, they'll have somebody over here in the corner just come over here, jump in your car and take off. So I tell my daughters, drive to the nearest place that you can find. You can call the police or whatever, but don't get out of your car. So be street smart. Know who you are and know what the scriptures have to say. So based on that, he now hits chapter 2. Not that the scriptures were divided in chapters and verses, but they are segmented in, in paragraphs, so we know exactly how the thoughts go from one place to the other. So in 2 Peter, and it's easy for us to relate because we're able to, to say chapters and verses and so on. So in 2 Peter chapter 2, Peter focuses on false teachers and their destruction. In fact, he says that, but there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false prophets or false teachers. The formation of the church was happening all along. You know, I think Wanda touched upon it, of how the prophets and, and what a prophet was and what a teacher was, and then we have the evangelist and we have other um, offices in the church. But when you come to the epistles of the church and you come upon the qualifications and the leadership of the church, what are the two ones that stand out? Elders and deacons. Okay, elders, the bishops or the pastors, and then the deacons, and we know who they are. So when things got to be refined, all of these things, so he says, you know, in times past, there were false prophets. Now, they're false teachers in our midst, and that's exactly what they are among you. So know your adversaries. Know your adversaries. Know the enemy. Know who they are. I mean, what do, we, what do they normally teach the kids, which now I think they don't teach them anymore, but if someone that they don't know is in school, you know, it, it could be, you know, you're bringing your dad to, to school and one of the other kids sees your dad and doesn't know exactly who, who he is and starts yelling, you know, stranger danger. And, uh, but I don't think they're using that anymore. Is that right? They don't use that uh, stranger danger anymore about seeing someone who they don't know in school, but now you have to go through this whole thing about um, authenticating yourself before you're admitted in a school. But know your adversaries. You know who you are. You know what the scriptures teach. So be aware of people. And you know what? We should be aware of each other. We should know who we are, where we stand. We should know if something, someone comes in here that we're not particularly, you know, overwhelmed with them or they're a little bit different. I don't mean odd and, and you know, eccentric. Eccentric, eccentric, but different, but they're just not right. They're saying things that just aren't right with the scriptures. They're doing things that aren't particularly correct. But he says, but there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord 
who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. So these are people who are going to be secretly introducing destructive heresies. They're in, in 2 Thessalonians 1.8, it says, In flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So they're false teachers who introduce something secretly. It's sort of like cooking a frog. What's the best way to cook a frog? Start slow. If you throw a frog in boiling water, what happens? He jumps right out. That doesn't do any good. Uh, you know, someone's not going to come up and <coughs> talk falsehood right away. You know, they're going to what? Just grease it. They're just going to bring it in slowly. They're going to just overcome things, and they're just going to just smooth it over, you know, butter it on both sides. That's what it's actually talking about here, secretly introducing destructive heresies. And many, Peter's not afraid, says he's talking to the church, many will follow their depraved conduct and will bring the way of truth in, disre in disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with fabricated stories. Anybody can remember stories about fabricating a story? How about, uh, this came to be true, but still was fabricated story, the magic beans, remember those? Sold the family cow for what, a handful of beans? Well, you know, this, the story had a happy ending, but, you know, the mother wasn't very satisfied that he, you know, gave the only milk cow away for a, some beans. And that, that's a fabricated story. I mean, I, I've got beans. If y'all want to, you know, pay me $10, they're magic beans. You know, I, they might grow, and, and you'll go up there to heaven and find a, a goose the lays the golden eggs and so forth. Anybody got 10 bucks? <laughs> They're greedy teachers. They fit in. They'll exploit you with fabricated stories. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them and their destruction has not been sleeping. God, they're going to get their end results. But these are the people that you're going to have to watch for. Many will follow their depraved conduct and bring the way of truth in disrepute. This is the church. Many people in the church are going to go that particular way, this particular way, because of these uh, secretly introducing these destructive heresies. They're going to exploit you with fabricated stories. And we know that we have to enter through what gate? The narrow gate? Why? Because the wide gate is the one, and the broad way is the one that leads to destruction. But the narrow gate is the one that leads to life. Isaiah 35, 8 says, And a highway will be there, it will be called the way of holiness. It will be for those who walk on that way. The unclean will not journey on it. Wicked fools will not go about on it. That's the road of, of holiness. Those are the things that we have to understand. There were false teachers in the church. In, in 2 Peter, others were referred to as professors of religion, profane scoffers, ridicules, mocks, scorns, heresies, and false teachings. They denied the Trinity and they promoted good works. So we have to identify the traits. How do we know that that person is a false teacher? And that's what Peter was trying to tell them. Know who they are. You know, we, we can sit here and we say, you know, we're very confident in one another. You know, we're very sure of one another. But when we are very sure, we're not any better than any other church. And you know you've had splits in churches. You know that one church has left and another church stays. Or, or some have, have gone this way and some have gone that way based on, on heresy things, things that are not true. You know, that some of the identifying, the identifying traits are that they're, that they're strangers. They're suave and debonair. You ever know, know people who are suave and debonair? Jerry made a comment, a nice comment about Sun City Center. She said, you know what? The people here don't seem to be hoity-toity. <laughs> you know, Sun City in general, even if it's a retirement area, you know, it's just that it doesn't, doesn't find that, you know? They don't, you know, go up with their noses up in the air or, or you know, blue bloods, you might want to call them, or, you know, or stuck-ups or whatever. They're just normal, normal people. 
They seem to, the, and so some of the traits, it, but these people are suave and debonair. They seem to fit in. They are seducers, and these people are experts at seducers, as deceivers, and as expert liars. They are narcissists. Now, who knows what a narcissist is? Hmm? No politics. <laughs> Think of, think of themselves more highly than they are, right? Okay, that's true. You know, if, if we can spot them a mile away because they want to be the center of attraction. They want to just light up the sky. It's different than entertainers because that's their job to entertain, you know, um, Elvis Presley, Liberace, some of the other entertainers are very glamorous in, in what they did and, and so forth, but that's entertainment was from, done for a purpose. And they're promisers. This will light up your life. Let me sell you something. Listen to what I have to say. So they're strangers. They're suave and debonair. They're, they seem to fit in. They're seducers and deceivers. They're expert liars. You know, what a, more of an expert liar than you want than Satan in the Garden of Eden. Oh, man, this fruit will give you these powers. You know, just, it'll just work. And look what happened. They are narcissists. They think of themselves more highly than they do of others. They were promisers. This will set you for life. In 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 9, and you see how the verses complement one another. But in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 9, it says, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of what? Godliness. So can you have, be, have a form of godliness yet have all of these things? Yeah, Scripture says you can. They have a form of godliness about them, but they're boasters. They love money. They're disobedient to parents. They're proud. They're blasphemers. They're unthankful. They're unholy. They're unloving. They're unforgiving. They're sl slanders. They're brutal. They're despiters of good. They're traitors. But they have a form of godliness. All of these things. I mean, that's, that's a very hard thing to distinguish. Someone who has a form of godliness and yet have all of these bad traits. But denying its power and from such people turn away, and this is Timothy's admonition to the church. For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women, loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres resisted Moses, so do these to the knowledge of the truth. I'm sorry. So do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds, disapproved concerning the faith, but they will progress no further, for their folly will be manifest to all, as there also was. So basically, they have a form of godliness. They, they're sort of like they have a halo, you know, but they, inside, what did Jesus talk about the Pharisees? They, had, they, were, they looked good on the outside, right? But inside they were what? sepulchers, filled with dead man's bones. That's who they were. They, they just distinguished themselves. They just thought themselves to be the best things to slice bread. Everyone was to look up to them. They called them teachers. They, everything else. They had a form of godliness, but they denied the power thereof. And the purpose was to counteract the internal difficulties, set the believers straight in not what to believe, but who to believe. And that's what this was aimed at. Who do you believe? And that's what Peter was trying to tell those churches. It's not what, because you're supposed to know the scriptures. You're supposed to know your relationship with God. But who are you supposed to believe? Because there's going to be a lot of people wanting to tell us one thing when we know that it's not right. Set the believers straight in who to believe and pursue spiritual maturity through the word of God. 
And then verse 4, 4 through 9 gives us a discourse. It says, if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment. Verse 5, if he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued Lot, a righteous man who was distressed by the depraved conduct of the lawless, for that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds. So if God did all of these things, if this is so, what Peter says now is if these things are right, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to hold the unrighteous for punishment. God will make the distinction. You're to know who, you, who it is within your church, but God's going to help you with that distinction. And so this is, this is basically, says, this is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desire of the flesh and despise authority. Bold and arrogant they are, not afraid to heap abuse on celestial beings. Not even angels, although they are stronger and more powerful, do not heap abuse on such beings when bringing judgment on them from the Lord. So not even the angels do it. Yet these people find, find time and find the power to do it. But these people blaspheme in matters they do not understand. They're like unreasoning animals, creatures of instinct born only to be caught and destroyed. And like animals, they too would perish. It talks also about the, the prophet Balaam. They will be paid back with harm for the harm they have done. Their idea of pleasure is to carouse in broad daylight they are blots and blemishes, reveling in their pleasures while they feast with you. That's fine, they eat with you, but they're doing all of these things. With eyes full of adultery, they never stop sinning. They seduce the unstable. They are experts in greed and a cursed brood. They have left the straight way and wandered off to follow the way of Balaam, son of Bezor, who loved the wages of wickedness. But he was rebuked for his wrongdoing by a donkey, an animal without speech who spoke without a human voice, and restrain the prophet's man, madness. Balaam was a, was a false prophet. He was, not a, he was not an Israelite. He was a Syrian. But there's three chapters in the book of Numbers that talks about Balaam and his prophecies and his acts, blessing, cursing, and so forth, so forth of, of Israel. So there's three chapters in the book of Numbers that's dedicated about Balaam's prophecies. The New Testament mentions Balaam three times, all negatively. Both Peter and Jude describe him as a personification of greed in using religion for personal gain. Second Peter and Jude, Revelation, credits him with the doctrine of Balaam, which is introducing others to sin, specifically to idolatry and sexual immorality. And certainly Balaam was no paragon of virtue, yet as unrighteous as he was, his prophecies remain in God's word. And he gave us an example of what these people are like. I mean, Balaam was, was just a, a prophet. He just declared God's word. He, he was supposed to have a blessing upon Israel, and, and he cursed them instead. And, and so he found his demise at the end of the, at, at a sword with the kings of the Midianites. So, so how can we differentiate between the real thing and forgery? And that's where we have that relationship with Christ. And that's why we're supposed to know the scripture. These people are springs without water and mist driven by a storm. Blackest darkness is reserved for them, for they mouth empty boastful words, and by appealing to the lustful desires of the flesh, they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. Just want to touch upon one thing about the prosperity gospel. How many of you heard about the prosperity gospel? Okay, so a lot of us have heard about the prosperity gospel. I, I would be rich today if, if, if I, you know, took it for face value. You know, you all have a plaque in the back there that, that um, you were admonished and, and um, you know, put on the fourth, um, out in the um, spotlight for your, for your giving. I think it was for uh, per capita. You know, it's just like a, a, a million member church giving a million dollars. And that was their offering. What does that equate to? A dollar a piece. Man, you know, a million dollars though, but that's a lot. You know, or a congregation of a hundred who gave ten thousand dollars. 
is how much? Okay, that's a lot more, isn't it? So, you see the difference there. But you're to be commended for that. Per capita is very important because I know as, as um, Southern Baptists, when we look at things, we see, well, that church is a small church, but look how much they're giving. Per person, they're giving an enormous amount of money. I mean, Jesus pulled his disciples, you know, from what they were doing and say, look at this woman. She's given all that she's got. Yeah, but look at that Pharisee. He dropped in a, you know, a couple of bills in there. But yeah, but look at this lady gave out of her poverty. He gave out of his wealth. He could have given more. She gave all that she had. So the prosperity gospel, sometimes referred as the prosperity gospel or the health and wealth gospel or the gospel of success, is a Christian religious doctrine that financial blessing is the will of God for Christians. Well, I'm still waiting for that ship to come in. <laughs> and that faith, positive speech, and donations to Christian ministries will increase one's material wealth based on a non-traditional interpretation of the Bible, often with emphasis on the book of Malachi. The doctrine views the Bible as a contract between God and humans. If humans are God, he will deliver his promise of security and prosperity. Confessing these promises to be true is perceived as an act of faith which God will honor. And I'm sure we're as faithful as can, as can be. Faithful in our prayer, faithful in our giving, Faithful in everything that we do as, as believers in Christ. We're faithful in, in, in helping people. We're faithful in going the extra mile. And faithful in turning the other cheek. But can I borrow a million dollars for any one of you? No. Neither could you borrow it from me. So in some ways, you know, if, if someone comes in here and, and wants us to buy, you know, stock into um, the Golden Gate Bridge or whatever, what do we do? You think we're going to buy into that? They were selling swamps, swamp land here in Florida, um, you know, many years ago. And that's exactly what you got with swamp land. Because you're supposed to know when things come into the church or when there's something different or when someone comes to the church, well, pastor, you know, I heard on TV, I heard on the Internet, you know, the Internet's true. No matter what happens, whatever the Internet says is true, it's true. You all seen that commercial. So it's It's true. But it's not. You're supposed to know your relationship with God, and you're supposed to know what the scriptures have to teach. It can be as subtle as that. It could be as, as bad as, as someone coming up here and saying, you know, the Trinity is false. There's not three gods. There's only, you know, one God. You know, they just say that so we can get more confused. You know, you'd run them out on a rail. Because that's not what we believe. We believe in, in God the Father, God the, the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Three persons, one God. And that's what we believe. We believe the scripture says that. But in other ways, look at, look at Jim Jones. He, he just secretly fooled how many people? Hundreds? And what happened? He got them to do what? Drink the Kool-Aid, right? He got them to drink the Kool-Aid. Based on what? Based on his preaching and his, you know, nice speeches and, and being suave and debonair and talking about, you know, these people really want to do you harm, the establishment, this is the true utopia, this is where it all goes, this is where we all belong. And so these things really happen. But we have to be sure, you know, not too long ago, the emphasis was rescuing kids from cults because they were joining cults. And you had, you know, you had people who would go out there and rescue your child from a cult because they were believing something that was not true. But because it was interesting, it was nice, and, and it was, you know, just different than the establishment, that's what they went after. And this is what one of the things we have to be aware of, that we're not going to get rich by certain ways. God's intent is, at least he didn't tell me I was going to be rich. He says, I'm going to get by. He says, I'm just going to get by by the Sweat on my brow, yeah, I'm just going to get by. I don't expect to be rich. You know, I want a car that takes me back and forth to work. I want to have enough money to, like I did, get my kids through college, to have a you know comfortable house. Doesn't have to be a mansion. I just want to live within my means and be comfortable and to be obedient, be giving what God has has told me to do. 
you know, if it'd be different if I was up here and, and all of you would be worth, let's say, $10 million a piece. That would be, that would be really ironic. Some of you may be worth $10 million a piece. I don't know. I mean, that's between you and God. But, but you know, everybody, and it's very rare that you have a congregation that everybody's, you know, $10 million or millionaires for that matter. You just don't see a lot of millionaires, you know, but I don't know. It just sort of rubs me the wrong way when I see people saying that, that I could have, you know, financial blessing. Yes, God's going to provide for me, but he didn't say I was going to be rich. He said I would be provided for. That's all we need is to be provided for, you know, to get, get by. Because if Christ commands us to sell everything, that's what got the rich young ruler in, in effect, right? Because he was told to sell everything. Give to the poor and come and follow him. Well, that's a huge. And God does, and Jesus doesn't change the way that he, he talks to people. That's one of his things. You know, leave everything and come follow me. You know, we make it easier for people. You know, but everywhere you have a discourse where, where Christ is, is encountering someone, he always tells them something. You know, pick up your cross and follow me. You know, sell what you have. Follow me. Leave your, your mother, your father, your sister, your brother. Come and follow me. Sell what you have. Give to the poor. Follow me. All of those discourses had to do one thing. It was self-denial and following Jesus. So these are the things we have to be um, careful about. Know your salvation. Be sure that you're professors and not, I mean, that we're not professors, but we are possessors of the scriptures. Because they have a form of godliness, they, be, they deny the power thereof. And there's also a verse here that I want to touch upon, is in um, verse 18, start at verse 18. It says, For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escape from them who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption for of whom a man is overcome of the same as he brought into bondage. For if after they had escaped the pollutions of the world to the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning, for it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. This doesn't mean that they were saved and became unsaved. It means that they were never saved in the beginning. They had a form of godliness, they were professors and not possessors. They were sort of like the seed that fell on different grounds. Some produced, some others. They, they were there for a little while, but they fell by the wayside. Sometimes we meet people like that. Sometimes we meet a friend who, who might have uh, made a confession of faith, and, and lo and behold, he's nothing compared to what he was before. And it might just be, you know, we're not to judge people based on that. We're not to judge whether they have died without Christ or they died with Christ. And that's one thing we have to be careful about. You know, we're not, there was only, there was one, one thief on the cross who was saved. We have that assurance. But remember, there was only one so that we don't become overconfident of the fact that anybody can do that. So it had been better if, for if it had, after they had escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning, for it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. It's better if they had not known about Jesus than to say, than to play the game, you know, you know, I believe I'm, I'm part of you all now forever and then, you know, be entangled again and fall by the wayside. They should never, sort of like blasphemy against the Holy Spirit and Christ warned the Pharisees, you know, don't blaspheme the Holy Spirit. You're saying that the spirit that I'm using to heal these people is a devil, is an evil spirit? And he warned them, you know, don't mess with God. Don't mess with the things that God has to say because they're in concrete. They're, they're sure they're, they're forever. They, they go from time to time. So know your salvation, know your scriptures. You know, you know basically when, and these, you know, these large churches that are, you know, thousands, they're mega churches. You know, they have to be even more careful because these are, Things that come in, they deal with their youth, they deal with, with um, small groups, they deal with Sunday school, they deal with, with everything. And sooner or later, everybody's believing something else because they don't know who to believe. And so you have these little sex and cliques within the church um, as far as that's concerned. I'm glad that Brother Goat is going through the book of Revelation because it just prepares us 
to know what the end, end times is. Everybody has a different interpretation of the book of Revelation. You know, if they ask me, I'm a, I'm a pantheist, and that it means it's going to all pan out at the end. Jesus is going to come. I don't know when, I don't know how, he, but he's going to come in the clouds, and those who are asleep are going to rise up, and those who are alive are going to meet him up in the air, or if we die before then, we're going to go to heaven. So it doesn't matter. It's going to pan out at the end. You know, the differences like that shouldn't affect us. You know, everything's going to be the same. You know, you're talking about beasts with seven horns, and you're talking about the great Babylon, and you're talking about the dragon. You know, we know that that's evil. We know that those things are evil. They're, the, they're what satanic powers are. And that's what's going to affect us as a nation and also as believers in Christ. Because my allegiance is to Christ. My allegiance also is to the United States, is to my family and everything else. But my first allegiance is to Christ because we must be willing to leave everything that we have for the sake of Christ. And that means everything. Because he's the only one who's going to give us eternal life. It, you know, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? No, I can't leave my family because by leaving them to follow you, that's too much. It's hard to do, but it's something that we have to realize. What will a man give in exchange for their soul? Because, you know, like the scripture says, today is the time or the day of salvation. 